Welcome again to our little trip through the book of Romans. We find ourselves at the end of chapter 2 as Paul gives us this explanation as to where we are with God and how God sees us and reconciles us to himself. I just wanted to make a little announcement before I continue, uh, before I forget. Next week on Sunday, just after church, we're going to have a baptism. I thought you'd feel that way. If there are any of you who have come to faith in Jesus Christ and have not yet been baptized, please see me and we'll have a conversation about it. And if you've come to a true living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the next obvious thing is to be baptized. And uh, it's a, the very picture of us dying to ourselves and living unto the Lord. It's kind of uh, the, the Christian version of turning over a new leaf, if you will, and making a commitment. And so as we do that, I would invite you guys to come on down to the beach. It'll be at Ideal Beach down at the end of the road and uh, it'll be about 1.30 in the afternoon. So uh, just let me know if you're interested uh, or if you haven't been baptized and we'll work that out. Uh, pray with me. Father, as we come to look at your word and understand more of who you are and how you see us, I pray that you might open up our hearts and our minds, that you'd free us from the distractions of this world and this life, all the unrest and all the difficulties and struggles. Lord, you know our hearts and you know how easily we are distracted. I pray that you might help us to understand you more and that you'd help us to be like you. So Lord, guide us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the title of this is Religious Hypocrisy. If you remember, the book of Romans is basically the gospel according to Paul. And so he's writing what it is to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But before he gives us the good news of who Jesus is and how he came to be a sacrifice for us, he has to give us the bad news, which is there's none of us who stand before God on our own two feet by our own righteousness. Whether we're a pagan or we're a moralist where we have a, a set of rules and laws that we live by, or even a Hebrew, somebody who has the revelation of God, has the prophets and Moses, all of us stand before God condemned because none of us can live a righteous life in the way that God wants us to. None of us reaches perfection. In fact, most people would tell you, well, I'm not perfect, but they still think like 83% of Americans that they're going to heaven. So as we look at this, we're gonna look at the religious Hebrew and how the religious Hebrew a, approaches God and their mentality about their righteousness. Um, how many of you have righteousness? How many of you have it of your own? <laughs> yeah, I have no reason to stand before God and say, you know, you're glad, you, you know, you should be really glad you picked me because um, I'm a good guy. And I'm not a good guy. Any good that's in me, I know that the Lord's uh, renewing and putting there and I don't have it on my own. But as we stand before God, all of us as a sinner, all of us fall short of the glory of God, as it says here in the book, and we're going to get to it. But as we get into it, we're going to talk about this religious hypocrisy, because no matter what religion it is that you subscribe to, all of them say there's a set of do's and don'ts. There's things that you need to do to be accepted and things that you don't do and you won't be accepted. And it's that simple. That's the difference between Christianity and every other religion. Every other religion is a law-keeping religion. And if you, were, if you were a Hindu, it's about emptying yourself. And so it's about being less of yourself, less concerned with yourself, less even cognizant of the world around you and just kind of unplugging your mind. Uh, that's the goal. And any time that you engage and you're concerned about anything in this world, you've sinned and fallen short. <laughs> so uh, I, I've done that a million times just this morning. Matthew chapter 12, verse 2 says this, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. If you know anything about the Jewish religion, you know that the Sabbath is Saturday. It is the last day of the week. And so it is, it is reverenced and it is specified in the Ten Commandments to remember it and to keep it holy. Except the Pharisees took it to a completely different nuclear level. If you did not wash your hands before eating, you were in sin. If 
you ate on the Sabbath by pulling heads of grain off. That was called harvesting. And if you rolled them around in your hands to take off the chaff and blow it away, that was called winnowing and harvesting. And eating it, um, you, you were in sin in so many different ways. And so the disciples were walking through a field on the Sabbath on their way to go to temple to worship God. And, the, and the, the Pharisees, of course, staying close and keeping a close eye on Jesus and his boys, they see them pulling some heads off, some ripe heads, rolling them in their hands and having a fistful of granola for breakfast on the way to church. It's much easier to pay attention when your stomach's full on Sunday, right? <laughs> so they get all on Jesus and say, your disciples are doing that, which is not accredited on the Sabbath. Well, the, the crazy thing is Jesus explains to him that they didn't do anything wrong and he defends them. And then they end up going into a synagogue and the Pharisees take a, take a, a, a man with a withered hand. He's paralyzed and it's withered. And they put him in the front row of this, of this place and it's a setup. And they ask Jesus, Jesus, is it, is it okay if you heal on the Sabbath? Well, that's a work, isn't it? And you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, is it, is it lawful for a man to heal on the Sabbath? And they were quiet. They couldn't, they couldn't answer. And he says, it's good to do good on the Sabbath, not evil. And he says, if you had an ox, wouldn't you, wouldn't you untie him, which you're not supposed to do, and lead him to water so he'd have something to drink on the Sabbath? Of course you would. How much more is a person than a man? And Jesus tells him to put out his hand. He puts out his hand, and it's made whole just like the other one. On the Sabbath, in front of everybody, right in the synagogue. He says, just so you know, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the whole purpose for it. And he is our Sabbath rest. So that's the context of all of that in the introduction. Boy, I hope it won't be that long for the rest of the day. I, you know, I have, it's one way when you're trying to get a, a message together in your head, and it's another thing to come out here and have to deliver it. <laughs> Beginning in verse 17 from chapter 2, we'll pick it up. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, Will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Amen. So as we get into it, he's addressing people who are Hebrew, they're circumcised, their boast is in that they are a descendant of Abraham, they are a recipient of God's promises, they are the people of God, they have the prophets, they have Moses, they've got it all. God has revealed and put all his cards on the table for this particular group of people, and what they ended up doing was getting very proud about it, and resting in rituals, and resting in law-keeping, 
and resting in position rather than a relationship with God, what they had was an arrangement. I do this, you make me go to heaven. It's all good. <laughs> Unfortunately, we know that that's not God's economy. It's not about doing good things and keeping a list because none of us does it perfectly, which is the only acceptable bar. There's no curve that God grades on. If you're not perfect and he lets you into heaven, you ruin everything. Right? That's right. That's, I've, I've heard it said, if you find the perfect church, don't go there because you'll ruin everything. <laughs> so, but I stayed anyway. So here we are. Here's the layout for, for the, the Romans. We're in chapter 2, which is the diagnosis of sin, and we're looking at the religious Hebrew. And we'll be looking at that into chapter 3 before we get the good news. The bad news is it doesn't matter what's your position. If you're a pagan and have absolutely no understanding of morality, if you have some kind of a moral code and an understanding of what you're to do, or if you understand the scriptures, if you understand God's revealed will in the Old Testament and the New Testament, all of us stand before God imperfect and therefore in need of a savior. So that's the bottom line. L listen to the way he explains the Jewish position. He says, indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form and the knowledge of truth in the law. That is a gigantic boast, right? And yet all of these things are what the Jews were called to, to do. Now, it's as though God is a judge and he's standing over them and saying, okay, these are your credentials. This is how you're, you're boasting before God that you've got, you know, you've got Moses, you've got the prophets, you've got the sacrifices, you have the temple, you've got everything that God provided and revealed to you. So that's who you are, and this is their identity. And yes, they were called to be every one of the things that you see here. Number one, a Jew is somebody, it's short for Judah, which was the southern tribe, one of the two southern tribes of, of Israel. Uh, the, the first 10 tribes in, I think, 722 B.C., they were taken away by the Assyrians, and then later on the Babylonians came and took over the southern section. But a Jew, they're, they're called Judah, but essentially the whole of the 12 tribes are Judah. Uh, they, they just use the term loosely so that you understand where the term Jew actually comes from. Some people use it as a derogatory comment, but they use the name of Jesus Christ in a profane fashion too, so uh, don't be offended. Indeed, you're a Jew. Uh, which means you're from Judah, and it means praise. So these people were called Jews, which has this connotation that they are praise to God, right? Th so they bear that name. You're, you are the, those who praise God. Uh, you rest on rule keeping. It's all about the law. And you know it, and you memorize the first five books, and, you know, you, I mean, that's usually what they would do if you were a young student. You boast in God that you have a relationship with God because he has revealed himself to you, this particular race of people. It's not just a, it's not just a keeping of, of laws, but it's also a descendant of Abraham that these things were promised to as a family. And you know his will. You know what it is that God wants. You approve of things that are excellent. In other words, you have discernment. You can tell what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. You're instructed in God's revealed will. You're confident in yourself as a guide to those who don't know as much as you do. And so this is the sort of thing, this is the attitude of the Hebrew. You, you, you are the light in the darkness. You're the instructor of the fool. You're a teacher of the immature or of babes and processing knowledge and truth. You, you got it together, man. That, that was the attitude of the Hebrew. And you remember when Jesus came, he was all about reproving those who were proud about these things. Because do you see any humility whatsoever in this list? Do you see anything like there's any fault in you whatsoever? No, you, you're God's gift to the world, apparently. And there's, this is who you are. You're God's revealed persona to the world, right? So that's uh, who they thought they were. It's funny because being a Christian is the same, isn't it? Think about how that applies. You, you bear the name Christian which means little Christ. 
I'm not putting a guilt trip on you. I'm just telling you what your name is. <laughs> you are a little Christ. You're a little Savior, okay? You are a little sacrifice for others. You're the one who turns the other cheek, goes a second mile. You get it? You're a little Christ. That's who you are. Do you rest on rule keeping? I hope not. Well, I go to church every Sunday and I read my devotions every morning and I make sure I pray. And you know, you can get really sidetracked into law keeping and thinking you're right with God or, be, or he loves you more because, well, after all, I had very good devotions today and I prayed for everybody I said I'd pray for and I went down my entire list of 17 pages and I mentioned everyone. We can get stuck in that, I'm just saying. You boast in God. I don't know about you, but I have a relationship with him. Not that I deserve it. You prove what is excellent. You know his will. You're instructed in God's revealed will. You understand the scriptures. You even have some of it memorized, right? Confident in yourself as a guide. Do you think that you feel confident in being able to explain the gospel to another human being? I hope you do. I hope you do it often. In fact, you get better at it as you do it. You know, tend not to trip over your words. You are the light in the dark. Jesus says you're a city on a hill. City on a hill, you, you can't hide it. It's up there and the, the lights are all lit and everybody sees. You're, you're the, the light of the world. Jesus said that of you, the Christian. Instructor of the fool. We better be. A teacher of the immature. Well, I sure hope so. He said, go into all the world, make disciples. We better have something to give, right? And also, the teacher of the immature and possessing knowledge and truth. Would you say that those things are true and that's what God calls of you as well? Absolutely. But there's a little twist. You have to carry that with this sense of unworthiness because none of us is worthy. We're like clay pots that God pours himself into. But you see, that's lacking in this entire statement. And so he moves on from here in verse 21. You, therefore, who teach another, who are the light to the blind and teacher of babes and all of that, do you teach yourself? You who preach what a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? Are you a teacher? Do you teach yourself? I don't know about you, but I'm in need of learning still. And so every time I look into the word, I, I don't want to just collect it so I can throw it at you. I have to collect it and I have to eat it and chew it up and put it into my life. And, and you know, it's really sweet in your mouth and then it's really sour in your stomach. It's because uh, putting it into practice is much more difficult than repeating it to someone else. It's a little like fixing someone else's house. It's always easier. I don't know why. I'm always, I have, always have more joy fixing someone else's house. Mine could be just falling down. There's, there's a brother who needs his house fixed. <laughs> you who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? H how many of you have stolen? It, it, okay, a few of you. All right. The rest of you are raising your hand on the inside. <laughs> that a man should not steal, do you steal? It's funny because we understand what God's will is and yet we fall short, don't we? And there needs to be this acknowledgement that we are broken vessels that God is rebuilding. And you who say you shall not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Well, I could say I've been happily married and I haven't committed adultery, but Jesus said, if you look at a woman and you lust for her, if you say, gee, she looks good, I wish she were my girl. You've just committed adultery. And that's not even following your, you know, your imagination and where it might go. That's just desiring someone else. So you who teach don't commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You're suddenly unqualified to teach such a thing. You who abhor idols, because the Jews hated idols and they, they were, they were uh, spoken against, do you rob temples? If, if you say that you hate idols, are you faithful about tithing when no one looks, when no one knows? 
are you faithful with your time and your treasure and your talents and giving God everything that he deserves? I'm not. And so in a sense, you rob God when you don't give him those things that he has programmed you for and equipped you for, and you don't do that which God has called you to do, you steal from God. Now, I know we, we don't talk to ourselves that way, but it makes it really hard for me to stand up here and tell you guys that you need to do something if I myself am not doing it. And you see, that's the problem with law keeping. It makes you intense about telling people the law but it somewhat exonerates you from doing it. Because instead of having a relationship with God, what you have is an arrangement. And that's a very different thing. So, do you boast in the law and do you dishonor God through breaking the law? Listen, I, I can witness about Jesus and tell you about how great he is and how he died for my sins and in the next minute, you know, somebody cuts me off and I'm saying things I shouldn't. And I don't know about you, but the devil loves to use that kind of stuff, get on my shoulder and say, you can't tell these people anything. You're a sinner. If they knew the stuff that went on in your head and your heart, they'd all leave. And it's true. But, the but is at the end, which is where it should be. So instead of looking outward and saying, I possess all this and you guys all need to adhere to it, I need to, it was completely unintended. <laughs> I need to take a look in the mirror, right? And I need to make sure that I'm doing those things that God would have me do and not just being a professor. Being a professor is easy. You think it takes lots of, you know, you got to get your doctorate and all that kind of stuff. You can profess anything. It's another thing to live it. And then people will see your behavior and they, your behavior will speak louder than anything you say. If you have kids, you know it's true. And so you need to look at yourself in the mirror. Luke 6, 39 to 40, Jesus is speaking here and he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And so what happens if you are a follower of the blind? You're going to fall into a pit. Jesus was trying to tell these Pharisees, you guys are trying to tell everybody to obey the law and they need to be perfect. And nobody can be perfect, except they're under some illusion that you are. And therefore it's attainable. And see, that was the whole problem with the religious system of the law. It causes people to be prideful because if I do what God tells me to do, I got something to pat myself on the back for. And I've acquired something. But unfortunately, one sin is too many and it precludes you from having fellowship with God or being in his kingdom for eternity. And you can't forget about that side. So... Self-help yourself into a little humility. The problem with this big, long statement of the Hebrew was there wasn't any humility. There was no dependence upon God. There was no uh, admission of sin. There was no contriteness. There's nothing in that statement. Just all, you know, we're all that in a bag of chips, and they go, yep, that's right. And sometimes we can get into that too. And he said, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. He says, because of you super hyper-religious people, God is mocked because you take his word and make it into something that it was never meant to be. And you take for yourself a position of glory that God never intended you to take. So you can't do that because you're forgetting how frail and feeble and how weak and, and horribly twisted you are in your sinful state. Here's what happened to just the Sunday laws when the rabbis got a hold of it. Now, you know it says that you should remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, right? On it, you shall do no work. Well, they figured that wasn't clear enough. We need to add some things so that you understand what that means. Hunchbacks, if you're somebody that has a bad back and you're walking by a church, you have to stand erect even if it hurts because it looks like you're bowing in deference to their God who's Jesus. I'm telling you, you can read this in the Mishnah. Lice are not to be killed on the Sabbath because that takes too much effort. That's work. 
Hebrew newspapers must not be read on the toilet. English is allowed. <laughs> because the language itself is sacred and shouldn't be in the bathroom. How that plays into the Sabbath day, I don't know. <laughs> Jews must not donate organs to a Gentile, although receiving is allowed. <laughs> it is permissible to degrade a woman on a kosher bus line. They don't have a very high view of women, just so that you understand. Violence may be used against those who distribute material contrary to the Torah. That's why if you're on a bus and it's the Sabbath and you're going through Jerusalem, you might have some very strong religious Jews throwing bricks at your bus. And it's permitted. Throwing a brick is okay, but you can't kill a lice. <laughs> These are real laws, guys. No writing more than two letters. On the Sabbath, you're not allowed to write more than two figures. Why two? I don't know. But they found a way around it. They have a Sabbath pen. A Sabbath pen has an ink that doesn't dry for three days. And so it's not really written until it dries. They make laws that are impossible and then they find a way around it. And that's why it says the Gentiles mock God because of you. Do you understand? This is what the world sees. No tearing of toilet paper, because that's work. On the Sabbath, you have to have it all pre-torn, because it's work. I'm not kidding. No ignition or fire suppression. You can't put on a light. You can't put a button for an elevator. You can't drive a car. You can't turn an ignition. You can't light your stove. You can't use the microwave. You can't open the door of your refrigerator. Unless you unscrew the light bulb because it makes a spark. And there's a prohibition against sparks making a fire. Actually, it's in the Old Testament, it's you're not supposed to make a fire on the Sabbath. In other words, keep your fire going. Don't let it go out. Make sure it keeps going through the Sabbath because making a fire back then included this. <laughs> you know, and gathering dry things. And it's a lot of work and putting stuff together. That's why that was prohibited. But they turned it into you can't turn the ignition on your car because there's a spark. This is what people do to God's laws when he makes it easy and he says, listen, I'm going to give you a day of rest. They turn it into a day of a lot of work. <laughs> no removing fish bones from your lunch on the Sabbath because that's separating and you're not allowed to separate. If you have a rotten tomato and you happen to see it on the Sabbath, you can't take it out of the bowl with the others. You've got to leave it there until the next day because that's called separating. And that's one of the 39 things that you're not supposed to do. No dragging a chair or scraping your foot on the ground because that's like making a furrow. It's like you're plowing. If you have a chair outside and you don't want to lift it because it's the Sabbath, you can't drag it because it creates a furrow and it's like you're plowing. But you don't ever intend on putting a seed in that. No spitting on dirt. A rock is okay. Because if you spit on the rock, if you spit on a rock, nothing will happen. It'll dribble down and who cares. But if you do it on the dirt, it might make a little trail if it's on an angle and you'll be creating a furrow and therefore you're plowing. <laughs> These are real laws in the Mishnah that, that an Orthodox Jew would have to obey on the Sabbath. No carrying of anything heavier than a dried fig. You also cannot pierce fruit on the Sabbath and put them on a kebab. You can't have a fruit kebab. You can use a, sh a Shabbos goy is permitted with certain provisions. A Shabbos goy, goy is short for goyim, which is what they call a Gentile. That's you and me. You can have somebody come and turn your lights on. You can have somebody come and turn your stove on. You can have somebody come start a car and give you a ride somewhere and come back, turn the car off, give you your keys back, and you can go back in the house. So you can make somebody else work on the Sabbath, but you can't work on the Sabbath. It's a common practice. And Sabbath, during the time of Jesus, 
you were only cer allowed a certain amount of steps from your door, and they figured this out because of the size, where the tabernacle was and the size of Israel and how far you had to go on the Sabbath day to go into the tabernacle and go home. And so that's a Sabbath day's journey they've determined. And so you only could go a certain amount of steps in a day, and then you were done. It's like you ran out of gas and you had to stop where you were. Unless you took a string the day before and you tied it. You're not supposed to tie anything on the Sabbath either. You tied string in your house and you could go up to like a quarter of a mile away and the string ends there. Then on the Sabbath, you can walk to the end of that string and say, this is an extension of my house and then begin counting your steps from that point. That's why the scripture says the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. It's because of all the things they do to try to get around all the laws they made. Let's make an impossible thing for everyone. I just think of all these angry men who had to live with their wives and they saw these silly things. You know, a woman is not supposed to look into a mirror on the Sabbath because she might see a gray hair and be tempted to pull it and that would be harvesting. I'm, I'm serious. This stuff is all written in the mission. You should read some of this stuff. So... That's what people have turned the law of God into, this hyper law keeping and this religiosity, this pride that comes because I did all this stuff. I did it perfectly. I know I read the Mishnah. I did what the rabbi said. And there's this tre tremendous pride that comes from doing all of the law, right? Except is it justified? We stand before God as a miserable mess of twisted thoughts and emotions and will that God has to come and intervene in our heart, give us a new mind and heart for us to be any better than we are. Because law keeping doesn't make you any closer to God. It never did. I could see Tevya saying, but why? <laughs> but so by the way, here, here's a store in Brooklyn and you can see on the door here, Shabbos Goy, available. Have, have, a, have a blessed... Uh, Sabbath. And if you need to hire a, a goyim, you can hire him here and he could do all that stuff on the Sabbath that you're not supposed to do. Except this is what Exodus 20.10 says. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. And in it, you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. You see, the real law of God was nobody does any work. Nobody. Nobody? Nobody. Well, what does that mean? It means the daily work that you would normally do, going out, working, sweating, you know, pouring yourself out to make something happen, create something out of nothing. Okay? Not worrying about pulling a gray hair because you saw it in the mirror. Not worrying about pulling toilet paper. I, but they have turned it into all these things. And that's why God is mocked because people set up all these laws and then they don't follow them themselves. Jesus said, you, you go and you make a disciple, you go far and wide to find a disciple to Judaism and then when you get him and you teach him properly, he is twice as fit for hell as you are yourself. You yourself are not going and you also permit, you don't permit other people to go because you load them down with laws that they can't do. That's the very purpose of the law. Did you know that? It's to show that we're helpless to meet God's righteous requirement. This is what people think of the Christian church. There are people that mock Christians and they mock the God of Christians and they mock the Jesus that we follow. Why? Because there are a bunch of knuckleheaded Christians that don't convey him very well. And sometimes we get all caught up on the law. But you know what? There's a prejudice because the Holy Bible in a toilet is considered art. But if you do that with the Koran, you're taking your life in your hands. There's a prejudice against Christians, if you haven't noticed. And then you find guys like this who says, God hates fags, fags die, God laughs. That's what the world thinks Christians are. Or they think something like this, the Catholic Church, 
and the Pope says, hey, it's okay if you molested one child in the past, but I, I think we can forget about that. That's what the world thinks of Christianity, of you too. Because this is the kind of stuff that goes on in our world, correct? And there's a little boy here who says, I can't forget about it. Thank God for dead soldiers. Soldiers die for fag marriage. These, these wonderful Christians that come up with these wonderful slogans, they cause people to mock God every single day because there's no love in that. There's no humility in that. There's no wanting to win somebody over to Jesus Christ and see them saved. There's no real love for a human being. So, or you get a whole bunch of people that, you know, like a mob turn out and they're, they're raising a stink. This, this guy's showing him exactly what he thinks. Over here, I had to block some of it out over in here. And you know, by doing things like that, you ask for that kind of trouble. If you're gonna be so full of hate and so full of judgment, because Christians, unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians who are law keepers. It's no different than the first century Hebrew. Or go to church or the devil will get you. Go to church or the devil will get you. If you're not here today, you, you people. <laughs> Do you think God loves you more because you had devotions today or because you didn't have devotions today? Do you think God loves you more? He couldn't love you more because he sent his son to die for you while you were still yet a sinner and hated his guts and ran from him, spit at him. You think he's going to love you more than that? How's he going to love you more than that? The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. For circumcision, which is of the Hebrews, is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. I always love when circumcision comes up in church. <laughs> God called the children of Abraham to be circumcised. The males, obviously, not the females. Don't sweat, ladies. <laughs> and it was a sign of a covenant before God that they were different. And if you think about it, it's the removal of flesh for greater sensitivity. I will leave it in the PG realm. <laughs> That's the sign of a covenant that you are committed to God. Okay? Now we do it for health reasons and all sorts of other things. But it is a sign that there's a covenant between you and God, that you're his and you're going to do whatever he tells you to do. Right? You guys get that, right? I can move on from this. It's a little like this. You have guys dressed in costumes on TV and they make movies, but you don't really believe that that's really Batman or that that's really Superman, do you? You don't really believe that they have superpowers, do you? They're in a costume, Okay. They're actors. They pretend. It's a show. It's not real. So everything you see on the outside is not real. In fact, most of the things in our lives are not real. You know, we put paint on walls so they don't look like they would otherwise. You know, we, we, we buy makeup. Some people do. I don't. <laughs> As you can tell. And to make something look like it really isn't, but see, these guys were getting circumcised and boasting in the fact that they were circumcised and looking down upon other people that were not, except it didn't mean anything if you're not doing what God wants you to do from your heart. So whatever ritual it is that you're proud of, that you can boast of, that you can you know, boast over another person with, it doesn't mean anything unless it's real. I mean, unless you're really Batman or unless you're really Superman, it's rather disappointing, I imagine, to be an actor playing them because you can't do what they really do. You got to take the costume off and then you're just a regular person like the rest of us. Have you ever seen a million dollar bill? If you have never seen a million dollar bill, that's because they don't exist. <laughs> this, this million dollar bill was actually taken to a bank Staff at the Pinnacle Bank branch in Lincoln, Nebraska, reported the Monday morning incident to the police. The Lincoln Journal Star reported that the bank employees say the man was adamant that this bill was real, despite Teller's attempts to convince him otherwise. 
The man eventually left with the bill, but without a new account in the bank. Police are reviewing surveillance video to try to identify the man. Police say that they want to check on his welfare and make sure that he was not the victim of a crime. The largest denomination note ever issued for public circulation is the $10,000 bill. Just in case you got some high rollers in your life, I don't want you to be deceived. But you see, that million dollar bill doesn't mean anything. It is a sign of worth without any worth. It is something that says it's something that isn't. And it's the same thing as circumcision to a Hebrew who does not keep all the law. If you don't keep all the law, it doesn't matter that you're, it doesn't matter what ritual or what religious observance it is that you take pride in, it's not enough. It's never enough to come before God's perfect standard. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, which by the way, no one does, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? You understand it doesn't matter that you're related to Abraham, you have the law, that you are related to Moses, that you know what tribe you came from, all your descendants. None of that matters if you don't do what God wants you to do, right? And so if you have some sign that uh, you are his people and yet you're not his people because you're not doing what he wants you to do, then it's bogus. Matthew 3, 9, Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, this was uh, John the Baptist. And do, do not think to say to yourself, we are of Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. If you remember, he was on the Jordan and he was baptizing in the place where they once had to cross the Jordan River and there were stones stacked, 12 of them on the shore, 12 of them in the middle. And he says, he can raise up children of Abraham from these stones if he wanted to. So don't take a boast. You can't rest in that ritualistic relationship. John 8, 47, Jesus says, he who, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. He was speaking to the Pharisees who had boasted of their wisdom and their knowledge and their understanding of the law and their relationship to Abraham. And he goes, you do what your father, the devil, tells you to do. If you really knew Abraham, if you knew what was going on, you would do what Abraham did, which is he believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. Matthew 7, 22 to 23, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What an incredible passage that is. People on the day of judgment will come before him and call him Lord, which is what he's called, what, that's his name. So they know his name. They know he's boss of everything. He's Lord. Lord, didn't we do, you see? They boast of the things they did. And he says, depart from me, you who practice wickedness. I never knew you. There's a difference between doing a bunch of laws and having a relationship. Amen. Jesus said, I never knew you. You did all this stuff and you were completely off the grid. I didn't even have a relationship with you. And they did some fancy stuff. Jesus put a really good list together, right? Casting out demons, doing miracles. Uh, when was the last time you guys, you guys do this on a regular basis? <laughs> that, that's, that's pretty high on, wow, these people got to be spiritual. And yet Jesus said, I never knew you. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, that's the difference between life and death. So you can, you can live your life by regulation and be judged by the law, or you can live your life in relationship. Verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, who is cir nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Did you guys know that? It's very quiet in there but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. Deuteronomy 10, 16 in the old Testament says this, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff necked no longer. 
God intended the external just to be a picture, a shadow. Like, you know, baptism is going to happen next week, but baptism doesn't save you. Baptism should be evidence that you're saved, which is a very different thing. Just so you know, I wasn't... Uh, Cherry picking scriptures, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. In Jeremiah 4, 4, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your hearts, you men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. You see, it's about the heart, which is God's always interested in. Jeremiah 6.10, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them and they have no delight in it. You understand, God had more important things than having you, you know, nip the tip. It's talking about being circumcised in your heart. If your ear is not circumcised, it's as though you, your ear is stuffed up and you can't hear things. It's about being open and sensitive to the voice of God. You guys understand? And that's really where God wants us to be, Have in a place of humility before God, in a place of moldability before him. Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 26 talks about the law. And it says, therefore, the law was our tutor or our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You see, the law was designed by God to show us that we needed a savior. And there's no way that we could keep the law. Even the unexpanded law is impossible. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. How are you guys doing with that one? Those two, actually. I need a savior. I need help because I can't do that. Not in my own strength. I'm selfish. I, I love an easy chair and TV all day and somebody bring me food. That's not thinking about anybody but me. I love the story about little orphan Annie. I don't know if any of you have seen the play or if you remember the, uh, the old the little orphan Annie. They had one in 1932, it was black and white, but then they had, uh, I think it was Shirley Temple who played, but uh, this is the one that I remember uh, that had Carol Burnett in it and uh, it was very active. It was on TV, 1971, I think. Little orphan Annie's a story of this orphan and, and she's very positive and she's talking about the sun coming out tomorrow and all that stuff. And like everywhere she goes, she's just this bright, sunshiny person, and yet she's under the care of somebody who's taking care of her in the orphanage uh, that really hates all of these children, and they stand between her and having the life that she really wants. And she puts heavy burdens on them, makes them scrub the floors, and makes them do everything constantly haranguing on them, not good enough, not good enough, go, 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 do, 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 get busy, get busy, you forgot this, you forgot that, you forgot, if you're a parent, it sounds familiar. But just constantly haranguing about they're not good enough, not doing good enough, and just being angry all the time. That's kind of like the law. That's a tutor that brings you to Christ. And then eventually she gets adopted uh, by Daddy Warbucks, and, and he treats her nice, and, and they end up being this wonderful family. That's what happens when we come to Jesus. I realize that in and of myself, I am a failure on the deepest level. And I need God to fix me from the heart. And there's no way I can be good enough. There's no self-help book that's going to help anybody to be right with God, unless it's the Bible. And it's not about self-help. It's about receiving a free gift. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come and learn from me because I am meek and humble of heart. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. My burden is light. My my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Sorry, I'm getting old. I shouldn't do that without a slide. <laughs> but you see, God is interested in adopting us as his kids. He's not interested in having a bunch of soldiers performing rules. What he wants is your heart, like we just, we just sang in that song. God wants our heart. 
above all things. So, I pray that you guys are blessed by this. It's either regulation or a relationship. Romans 14, 23, it says, whatever is not from faith is sin. In other words, anything that you don't do, knowing that God would have you do it, and having absolute rest in that assurance is sin. So if you do something and you're wondering whether you should do it or not, you blew it. You know, I'm really not sure if I should uh, do this. And you do it, and it says anything not done in faith is sin. If you can't do it confidently knowing that God would have you do it because the Holy Spirit's put there to tell us those sort of things, and some of it is a little different for you than it is for me. There are things I can't do that you can do, and there are things that, you know, you can't do that I can. So... Like, be sarcastic. So, whatever is not done from faith is sin. Hebrews 11.6 says, for without faith, it is impossible to please him. And it doesn't matter what you do, how many laws you keep. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How do you please God? You do it by faith. And without faith, you can't please God. And if it's not done in faith, then it's, it's sin. Romans 8, 3 says, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh because we can't do everything God asks us to do. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So God sends the law to let us know that we have a problem. He sends Jesus to solve it. The only way we're gonna have any approaching doing God's will is to die to ourselves and give ourselves over to the purposes of God in asking Jesus to be our savior. And that's the bottom line. And that's all I can boast of, is that I received a free gift. No different than if I got a Lotus or a Ferrari or, a, or a anything and, and I owned it. It's, I, I have a wonderful little car, it's called a Mini Cooper. It was given to me by my son, so I will boast of it. Because it was a gift. It was a free gift, all I had to do was receive it and drive it. And it's the same thing with Christ. He doesn't make us work, work it off, thankfully. It's about grace, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't picked it up, it's the name on the front of the building. It's the only way that we can stand before God. It's not on our own two feet. It's not who you're related to. It's not who you know. It's not how much money you make, not the color of your skin. It's not what job you have, how much you have in the bank. None of that brings us before God. How many great things you did this morning before you even came here? None of it matters. What matters is, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Savior? And that's the bottom line. And if you don't, please speak to me. Please speak to one of the, one of the, the, the sharp people here that knows Jesus Christ and will be able to explain it to you very simply and lead you in a prayer. We would love to do that. Your righteousness comes from a relationship, not religious ritual or rigorous law-keeping. I have been made right with God because of Jesus Christ being the sacrifice for my sin. He took the punishment I deserve. His righteousness has now been given to me as a gift. My sin was taken upon the cross and I bear it no more. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.